Hello everyone, I'm the Saxy Gamer. Today we're here for yet another gameplay and analysis video, this time with a recent game that I played as Guitarja. So whenever I was uh, going to play this game as Guitarja, I was thinking about, you know, what what's what's good to go for on Guitarja, and really there's two main things that you want to go for with Guitarja. Um, so normally what she's very good with is a religion slash domination type of playstyle, just because she gets a little bit of extra faith from having cities on the coast, so if you're able to get a lot of cities on the coast, that gives you a lot of extra faith, which then makes it so that you can buy more naval units with that faith, and then that just kind of builds up your navy even a little bit more, and then you can go and steamroll people. Um, so for this reason, I was looking to go for either a domination or religious victory, uh, kind of just whatever, whichever one happened to come first, because whenever you're going for crusade, um, you, you pretty much have to convert people in order to get that military strength boost, so normally whenever you go for a crusade military game, uh, it, it kind of just happens that whichever one happens to come first, you know, sometimes you are able to convert more cities first before you're able to take all the capitals, but sometimes you are able to take all the capitals before you convert cities, so either one was uh, okay with me for this game. As far as the early game, I was hoping to rush for a religion, because obviously if I wanted to, you know, do a religion slash domination game, Crusade would be the perfect thing for that, and um, you need to get a religion, so whenever you play on Deity, you pretty much have to rush for a religion, so that was the early game goal. And then once I had had that religion, I decided that it would be a good idea to do a naval attack on one of my nearby neighbors, because at this point I could uh, spread my religion to them, use Crusade, uh, buy a few uh, naval units with Faith, and then use that extra combat strategy to kind of start the snowball towards a domination victory. So with all of those goals in mind, I went ahead and I set up the game, obviously playing as Guitarja on Deity Difficulty. Uh, I went for standard map size here, and for the map type, this is something that actually is important with these goals in mind, so I chose Island Plates, just because Island Plates has some pretty small land masses, so there ends up being a lot of coastal cities, which means lots of opportunities for naval domination. Um, if you were going to set up a game like this, you could go Island Plates, you could also pick something like Archipelago, or even Small Continents will sometimes work as well for, uh, for a game like this. Um, aside from that, though, I left all of the other things on standard. I believe that I added a few more city-states. I don't actually have the footage in front of me right now, so I don't remember, but I just generally like to add in, you know, one or two more city-states to make up for the ones that the AI will inevitably, inevitably be taking. So I went ahead and I started the game and I got my spawn here and luckily, unlike the uh, the game is Nubia, this spawn was actually fairly decent. So uh, some things to take note of here is that um, for one, I am not on fresh water right off the bat. I'm, I'm on coastal water, which is it's still it's you know it's better than no water, obviously, but still it's not it's not quite the same housing bonus as uh, fresh water would be. But you can see that there is a lake that is one tile away. So what I can do is put an aqueduct there. Um, one other thing to note is that I could have moved and turn two settled on that lake, but the reason that I didn't is because I would much rather uh, prefer to be coastal because if I settle on that lake, then I would have to build a harbor in, in, in order to get any of my naval units out to the ocean, and that's something that I didn't want to do because that would just delay the, uh, the amount of time before I was able to get a navy out and exploring the world. So what I was able to do instead was just uh, plan out for an aqueduct there, so that way, eventually at least, I would be able to get some fresh water in the capital. The other thing that I planned out here was my holy site, because since I was planning on going for a uh, religion, I obviously was going to need a very early holy site, so for those reasons, I planned out the holy site to be right next to the aqueduct, um, and also adjacent to those lake tiles and the mountain, so this would end up making it a plus three holy site, because it would get one from the mountain, uh, one from the two adjacent forest uh, tiles, and then one from the two adjacent lake tiles, because we are playing as Indonesia. Also with that in mind, uh, this does mean that the first thing that I want to research is astrology. If you're playing on deity and going for a religion, you pretty much have to go astrology first every single time, because otherwise it is painfully difficult to try to compete with the AI in order to get your religion before them. Um, you might get lucky and just have AI in the game that don't really like to get religions, but almost every single time they will, they will rush religions pretty hard, so you have to rush it as well. As I was exploring around a little bit here, I, I did find some actually some quite good things. So for one, I did meet Buenos Aires, which is really good for going for a uh, religion rush, because Buenos Aires is, uh, well, just any industrial city-state type, 
Their first Envoy bonus gives you extra production when producing uh, districts and buildings in the capital. So since I'm going to go for Astrology and rush for a Holy Site, I'm going to get a little bit of extra production whenever I'm putting down the Holy Site itself. And I'm going to get a little bit of production whenever I'm building a Shrine. So for going for a Religion Rush, uh, it was actually really lucky to meet Buenos Aires. Not to mention the fact that their Suzerain bonus is quite good later on. Because that's the one that gives you uh, extra amenities from having bonus resources in your cities. So this is good for Domination because it helps you combat war weariness a little bit. Another thing here is as I was exploring around with my scout, I found quite a few good locations for some canal cities, and this continent as a whole was ended up being really insanely, like, just kind of cool for, uh, for canals, and you'll see later on in the game that I was actually able to effectively cut the entire continent in, in half by using canals and cities like that, so um, I did plan out for this canal city here at the start, but that one, like, never actually came to fruition, but in the end I was able to get actual canals out that made... Things pretty uh, pretty cool and, and allowed me to get my naval units uh, like across the continent very easily. So you can see here that although I'm planning on rushing for a religion, I am still building a settler in the capital just because whenever you're going for a religion rush or something like that, you have to pretty much dedicate all of your resources in your capital towards getting that religion. So therefore, it really impedes your progress towards other things if you don't have a second city. So for that reason, I did make sure to get a settler before I uh, actually started building my holy site. And with that settler, I went and I actually decided to settle a city, you know, not on that canal city market that I had put before, but there was a big of a better spot that was on that absolutely gigantic lake. Too bad I wasn't playing the Netherlands. I could have got some some insane polders on that lake. Or uh, I unfortunately wasn't able to get Hoi Teokali in that uh, in that game either. But it would have been insane. But I figured that this spot was better than going for the Canal City. And also I was able to find uh, Uluru, which was helpful towards you know finishing off astrology. But I also saw an opportunity to put down a canal city next to Uluru that would allow me to get ships out from uh, Monoram out into the ocean by using that canal city. So those two things were very good and I saw that little bit of synergy there so I figured why not I can get a better city out of it and I can still get uh, ships out to sea by putting that canal city down. So that is what I ended up going for um, at, at this stage in the game. You can also see now that after building that settler in uh, Majapahit, I decided to just go for uh, the the uh, Holy Site District. I'm sorry that I'm saying uh, so much, but you can also see here that I did meet Poland. So Poland ended up being my nearest neighbor, and unfortunately for me, their, uh, their, their capital and the cities that I found are not settled coastally. They're actually settled quite far inland. So this is a big problem for me because obviously whenever I was talking about my plan earlier, I said that I wanted to do early naval domination because... That's just a lot easier for someone like Indonesia who can get extra ships with faith, uh, but they can't buy land units. So obviously it's a little bit easier to do naval domination, but that's simply not possible just because of where Poland is located. So this kind of started to throw a wrench into things. Um, and really what it did was it just forced me to have to go for land domination instead. But e e like either way, it wasn't that much of an issue right now because I still had to finish rushing for my religion. So I built a shrine in my capital to get that extra great profit point per turn. And then I ran one instance of holy site prayers to get a few extra uh, great profit points. But as you can see from the great people menu, there wasn't really much competition as far as getting a religion just yet. So I didn't feel the need to go for additional runs of holy site prayers. Um, so I just went and started building some land units and an extra settler as well to settle another city. After all of this had happened, I actually ran into a little bit of a barbarian problem because some barbs started spawning uh, just to the west of my capital. And normally this wouldn't be that much of an issue, and uh, by this point I was starting to build some military units, so that way I would have the land uh, army that was necessary to go and attack Poland. But the problem here is that they started stepping on my holy site, and this is something that you really have to watch out for when you are going for a religion rush, because having enemy units that stand on your holy site makes it so that it will not generate any great profit points, um, and obviously, well, they're going to raise it, so that way... They're going to burn the buildings that produce the great profit points, and they'll burn the district as well. So you're going to have to rebuild that in order to make any progress towards getting your great profits. So I, I pretty much made it a priority uh, at this point in the game to get those barbarians off of my holy site and take out their, uh, their uh, encampment just because I didn't want to have my progress towards a great profit ruined just because some stupid barbarians were spawning and burning the district to the ground. 
This also kind of just lined up with the other things that I was going for, because obviously, as I mentioned, I was going to need an army to go and attack Poland, so I could, in the meantime, use those resources to take out the Barbarians, you know, maybe get a little bit of unit experience, and also have that army afterwards to be able to take towards Poland. So, moving on into the Classical Era, things were a little bit, you know, not that exciting for the first bit. It was pretty much just me spamming out some warriors and preparing to attack Poland. So, another thing that I was doing is I got open borders with Poland and I was using my scout to go and scout out all of her city locations. Just so that way, I would be able to form a little bit of a plan in advance to determine where I wanted to attack. So, one of the nice things here is that although most of her cities are not on the coast, she does have one. I'm not even going to try to pronounce it, but it also happens to be the closest one to me. So I decided that that would be the uh, be the perfect target for the first city to attack just because it has the coast there. So I would be able to hit it and I have a good amount of space that I can use land units to kind of preemptively set up around it. So for that reason, I decided that that was going to be my first target there. I also was able to found my religion here, and for my beliefs here, you can see that I went for choral music and crusades, so I went for choral music as the follower belief, just because I generally tend to like it whenever you're going for domination, because it kind of helps you keep up with some of the policies, and some and policy cards can be really important when you're playing for a domination game, because you can get things like reduced unit upgrade cost, uh, reduced unit maintenance cost, there's there's quite a, a, quite a few good militaristic policy cards that really help your domination game, so for that reason I went for choral music just to kind of keep up my culture because I wasn't really planning on building any theater squares so I had to get that culture from somewhere and then obviously crusade just because you know it's crusade and I'm going for religion slash domination so 10 extra combat strength whenever I'm attacking people is insanely good. Soon after that, I was able to get my first government as well, and I obviously went for oligarchy just because I am playing on going a domination game, and getting a, an, an additional 4 combat strength on my melee units is good because most of my army is warriors, and for my navy, I'm mostly going to have galleys at the start, so getting 4 combat strength on all of those units is really nice, and the additional unit XP is good as well. For my policies here, I did go for Maritime Industries to help me with producing my naval units. I also kept God King where it was because I do want a little bit of extra faith to help me buy missionaries and also some naval units as necessary. Um, I went Charismatic Leader for the Diplo slot just because I generally tend to like it a lot more than whatever the other option is. Just because it gives you more consistent, you know, uh, Envoy bonuses. And I also went a Goge in my Wild Card slot because... Although I am building naval units, I also am in need of a lot of melee, just land units as well, so a goge is a good way to help get those out just a little bit faster. Shortly after that, I was able to convert uh, Poland City to my religion. Also, you know, of course it's named Snippy Snippy because that's that's always the religion. I don't even remember how that started, but it's it's some sort of joke from whenever I used to play, like, I think Civ 5 multiplayer with my friends or something like that. It, may, it might have started in Civ 6, but... Uh, nonetheless, though, I was able to convert the city to my religion, which means I would be getting that crusade bonus. So at this point, it was time to declare war. And from there, uh, war was actually pretty straightforward. This city actually fell pretty easily, like surprisingly easy, I, 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 I had thought, just because um, I was able to get all those warriors around. The galley was doing quite a bit of damage, you know, attacking from, from the sea there, just because I had crusade. So for that reason, this city fell pretty easily, and then it was time to move on to some of the other ones. Roklaw became the city that I was targeting next in my domination spree here, and one of the issues was that Poland did have quite a few units, so it was a little bit tricky just because I didn't want to lose my warriors while trying to attack some of her units, so what I did was I started building archers in some of my other cities along with the city that I had just captured to deal with some of those units, and also, you know, help protect my warriors whenever I was going to surround Roklaw. So, sieging Roklaw was actually pretty difficult here just because she had so many units that kept doing some damage, I was losing quite a bit of units just because I was getting killed. She eventually got out Crossbowmen as well, which was an absolute pain in the butt. After a while though of just doing slow sieging and things like that, I was able to convert the city to my religion, which definitely helped a lot. And I was able to get out the crossbowman that was in there. I, I mean, I guess I didn't really get it out. She just kind of moved it out, which was very stupid of her. But I was able to convert the city to my religion. Uh, I was able to get the city under siege by using my warriors. And then I was able to take Roklaw, which made things, you know, it was, it was definitely a, a big, 
sigh of relief whenever I was actually, you know, pretty certain that I was going to take the city because for a good while there, things were pretty, pretty tough and I wasn't sure I was going to be able to take it, but eventually Roclaw did fall as well. As far as my next targets were concerned at this point, I decided that I would go for Lodz just because it was settled coastally, so I would be able to get some naval support there. The only issue with this is that it was really hard to get land units over there because of the mountains that were there that were kind of blocking me from easily getting units in. The other really big issue was that these crossbowmen were just, <laughs> they were killing me so bad. Fortunately, I was able to start upgrading the swordsmen pretty shortly after I had taken Roclaw, which definitely did help a little bit, but even swordsmen get beat up pretty hard by crossbowmen, so it was just a matter of playing very, very carefully, using my archers to take out the crossbowmen, and using some of my melee units to kind of try to bait the crossbowmen into spots where I can kill them with archers. And if this was, <laughs> this was... It just took forever, pretty much, is, is what I'm saying here, just because I had to play so carefully. I eventually was able to convert Lods to my religion and take it. And once I had taken Lods, I was actually able to pretty easily take her capital as well, just because whenever I was taking Lods, I, I just got a bunch of units to move around the capital as well to kind of deal with the crossbowmen that were coming out from it. So shortly after I had taken Lods, the capital was about to fall, and then unfortunately I got a military emergency declared on me. Which is really, really bad, because whenever you get a military emergency declared on you, you lose two combat strength against all of the members that participate. And I know two combat strength doesn't sound like a lot, but really it does hurt when you consider the fact that the DDAI are already getting a combat strength boost, so losing another two combat strength against them really, really hurts. So this emergency actually really slowed me down in terms of the domination game, because... Both Poland and Persia had joined the thing, so previously, obviously, I wasn't at war with Persia, but they were kind of my next target, so at first I was like, oh, you know, it'll be it'll be fine, because now I can go ahead and I can, you know, have a reason to attack Persia later on without even having to surprise war them, so I, I thought things were good. But then they just were spamming so many catapults and immortals, and Poland was spamming out a ton of crossbowmen. They were killing a bunch of my swordsmen just because they were you know, triple hitting my swordsmen with crossbowmen all in one turn, which is pretty much just an instant death sentence to a lot of my swordsmen. And I lost a lot of my swordsmen, I lost a few of my archers as well, and things were really, really bloody while trying to defend the city of Lodz, and eventually I was able to come out on top, and this was something that just slowed me down tremendously, because I had to spend, I, I pretty much had to spend the entire 30 turns that I could have spent, you know, finishing off Poland, I had to spend it defending my city instead. As far as city defense is concerned though, if you want to take any tips from this, the big thing to know here is that you just want to prevent any melee units from be being able to attack the city. So you can see here what I did was I strategically placed my swordsman and my one warrior there that was on the east side, just so that way I would have control over all of the land tiles that were around the city. Because if there's no melee units that are able to hit the city, then it can't be taken because obviously ranged units can't take cities. So as long as you're able to maintain control of those spots, then you should be fine. And the big thing here was just keeping up enough of those defenses so that way they wouldn't be able to break through while using some of my archers and quadreams and things like that to take out the units that were attacking the city. And although this did take forever, I did lose a lot of units and a lot of my military strength, but eventually I was able to get upgrades into crossbowmen, which definitely helped out a huge amount. By the time that the emergency was over, I had luckily already gotten Zhongs, which are my unique unit, and these things are really good because they are replacements for frigates, and they get an additional amount of combat strength from having units that are in formation with them. So, I made sure to pair the ones that I had with some builders, well, I didn't have enough builders quite at the start, but... I was able to use these Zhongs to start attacking Persia because I figured why not, I could go and kill two birds with one stone and finish off Poland at Radom and go ahead and take Sparta as well, and this actually was decently effective. I was able to take Sparta pretty easily. Uh, Radom did not fall quite so easily just because I was getting a lot of my units killed because of crossbowmen that were in the city and the city's walls and also the encampment that was there. So things were definitely not exactly easy, but eventually I was able to take the city and finally take Poland out of the game, which I was <laughs> I was very glad to do because, man, they had, they had made this, this initial attack very hard. And at this point in the game, 
I was strong, but not extremely so, because I had about as much land as, you know, someone like Persia, and I had met people like John Curtin and Teddy, who I had seen, had much more science per turn than me, they were, they had, you know, much more control over the things that were around them, and I was kind of, you know, fragmented at this point and needed to pull myself together. Unfortunately, though, for me, another military emergency prevented me from doing this because there was one that was declared on me to defend Sparta, which I had taken from Persia, and obviously I didn't have a choice but to, you know, defend that. And here is where I actually make a pretty big mistake, so I decided at this point that instead of just trying to defend the city and, you know, repair all of the stuff that I had taken from Poland and build myself up a little bit, I decided that I would just keep attacking Persia, which was definitely a mistake because I started to get some losses here whenever I was um, trying to take the city of Ray and they had bombards and they had pretty strong walls and my my jongs were getting hit pretty hard by some of the city stuff there and this was a big problem because I wasn't getting much done I was still you know not paying attention to the cities that I have taken from Poland and even whenever I had taken the city of Ray I was having some big loyalty problems there because it was so close to Persia's capital and the, the rest of its cities. So keeping with this theme of stupid decisions, I decided to keep going and try to attack Persia's capital, which ended up being a really, really just a terrible decision because at this point, Ray was still rebelling and I think, like, I think what I was thinking here was that maybe if I was able to take the capital, that would help stabilize the loyalty, which is, you know, it's, it's fairly true. The only problem here is that the capital had 74 combat strength and every hit that my Zhongs did on the walls was pretty much negligible. So as I was trying to take the capital and and obviously at this point I hadn't converted it to my religion either, which didn't help. Uh, Persia uh, started to send in some privateers, which were doing a good bit of damage to my Zhongs. I lost a few more Zhongs, and at that point I, I kind of got the message that, alright, maybe I should just back off because I'm taking a lot of losses here. I'm not improving the cities that I have, you know, back that I had stolen from Poland. So all I need to do here is make sure that I'm able to defend Sparta and keep as many of my units alive as possible. And then after this emergency is over, I can kind of regroup. That way I'm not losing that two combat strength anymore, and then I can go for another attempt at attacking Persia. So that's what I did, and that was the smart and correct decision to do at this point. So after the emergency was over, I made peace with Persia, and luckily he gave me a ton of gold per turn, which was really good because I really needed to build back up my navy a little bit. So what I did in this time between wars is I built some more Zhongs. I, you know, kind of kind of built myself up a little bit. Uh, one of the problems here was that Sparta was about to rebel because it was really close to Persia and obviously having a lot of population pressure. So what I did is I changed up my policy cards a little bit just to give me a little bit time, more time until the rebellion. And I saw here that I was going to go into a golden age in the next era. So I figured, you know, why not? I should at least try for this. And I was able to actually save it at the very last turn of the era. I was able to buy myself one more turn for uh, Sparta to not rebel and then it was stable at the next era which was super super lucky. Another thing that I wanted to do during this time in between the wars was convert Persia to my religion because obviously if I was converting them to my religion then I would get the crusade bonus and that would make things easier so Fortunately here, uh, I don't know when it had happened, but I had met Yerevan and I had become their suzerain, so I was able to get some, uh, I was able to choose any of the promotions that I got on my po my apostles, and this is why Yerevan is such an insane city-state for any type of religious game, because you can just immediately choose the, uh, e the elimination of 75% of other religious pressure in the city. So what I would do is I would get one of those guys that eliminates pressure from other religions, and then I would get another apostle that would get triple strength in other civilizations, and I would send them together to convert cities, and generally one spread from each of them would be able to, to convert cities. So with that, I was able to start converting Persia cities and make it so that I would be getting the crusade bonus in my next, my next crusade, really. Another thing that I was doing was I was combining some of my Jongs into cores. So what I would do is, so one of the things as I mentioned in, I think it was the the uh, combat in-depth video, was that whenever you combine into cores, you don't retain promotion. So if you have, you know, like, well, you do, but not from two different units. So if, so if you have a level 2 Jong and a level 2 Jong and you combine them, you don't get a level 4 Jong. It just stays as a level 2 Jong. So what I would do is I would purchase a few fresh ones just because they would have no promotions. And then I, I would combine those with the already promoted ones and then form those into cores. Well, I guess they're not really cores at this point. They're, what are they? Are they fleets? Yes, they're fleets. So this was able to get me a 
pretty big uh, and sizable combat strength boost while I was attacking Persia's capital, and from there things actually went a lot smoother. I was able to take the capital pretty easily, I was able to take some of his other cities, and from there things were just, uh, they were pretty smooth sailing honestly at this point, because as I was converting his cities to my religion, I was getting that nice crusade bonus, I had had a few great admirals to give me even a little bit more combat strength, I wasn't in an emergency this time, and also I was have, able to have my Jongs that were in a formation with some builders and, uh, you know, great admirals and stuff, so for that reason I was able to get a huge amount of extra combat strength and really just kind of tear through Persia's cities. So much like with Poland, I decided to take Persia out of the game, and the reason that you want to totally eliminate people is because whenever they're out of the game, uh, the AI don't like look down upon you as much for having grievances, because if somebody's dead, they don't have any grievances with you, so obviously that, 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 that influences how the AI views you, which I think is a little goofy, because if you totally kill someone, you know, I would consider that worse than just attacking them, but for, for whatever reason, uh, totally killing people in Civ 6 makes the, the other AI hate you less in the long term, so I did did go and totally eliminate Persia as well, which took quite a bit of time, and at this point in the game, I was actually, I was getting, you know, pretty late into the game, and I was getting to the point where I almost had battleships, you know, I, I, I had already had ironclads, and what I needed was oil, and I did see that there was some oil in my land, but it was all on water tiles, which means you need to get the plastics in order to be able to put the little offshore oil, oil platforms down, so I needed to get to this a little bit sooner, and I did see that there was oil down in the tundra, so... What I did was I purchased a settler and I sent him down there to just go and settle directly on the oil tile. That way I would at least start to uh, collect some oil so that way whenever I was able to research battleships, I would just able to be uh, to upgrade all of my Zhongs into battleships. So, I mean, one of the things though is that battleships actually require coal instead of oil. I was just being stupid and thought that they required oil. But either way, I, I at least now had a source of oil that was um, under my control and I was able to use this to build submarines as well, so I was able to upgrade into some battleships for a very nice military power spike, finish off Persia, and also get some submarines as well. At this point in the game, I was pretty strong in terms of both, you know, yields on science and culture, and in terms of just raw military strength as well, so after eliminating Persia, I was pretty confident to just go and immediately attack my next target, which happened to be Nubia, just because, you know, they were they were next in the, the eastward direction that I kept attacking people in, and I scouted them out a little bit with an apostle, so whenever you're going for religion slash domination, you can use your religious units to scout out because you're able to move through people's territory, even when you don't have open borders with them so before you go to war with them it is a good thing to use your religious units to go and find where cities are find where encampments are and things of that sort so here you can see that in order to take Meroe, it was a little bit of an issue because there was no direct path over there uh, because there was a little bit of a land bridge between uh, Ikan and Shiat that I was going to have to get through. So I prioritized taking those three cities, uh, Ikan, Rapa Nui, and Shiat, so that way I would be able to control that land bridge, put down a canal, and then get over to Nubia's capital. One other thing that I do want to mention here is that uh, this is just something to pay attention whenever you are going for a Crusade game. So whenever you have Crusade active, you need to make sure that you are actually in the tiles of the city that you are attacking. So um, you can see here that whenever I was attacking both Rapa Nui and uh, Ikan, what happened was that I had converted the cities to my religion, but I was like, man, like, why are my battleships still doing like no damage? I, I thought I should get more. Well, the issue was that although I was attacking the city, you have to have your units in the tiles of the city. So I, I had to move my battleships in a little bit closer to the city in order to get that extra combat strength, and then things kind of fell a little bit easier. So just keep that in mind whenever you are attacking cities, especially whenever it's something like this where you don't clearly see the border between city tiles. Just make sure that you are in the tiles of the correct city that you want to be attacking in order to get the bonus from Crusade. So after some more of the usual fighting that I had been doing for pretty much the entire game at this point, I was able to take those three cities that I had mentioned that I was looking to take, and I needed to get down that canal in shot, so what I did was I slotted it out, and then I used the gold that I had, because at this point I had like over 10,000 gold, so I purchased military engineers, because military engineers are able to rush districts like aqueducts and dams and canals, so 
I purchased military engineers in two of the cities that I had gotten there, and I used their charges to rush the canal. And this was something that, you know, I, I don't know why, but I for whatever reason, I like I thought that this was like a big brain play, which it kind of was in a way. So be looking for opportunities like that that maybe you can do, because at this point, I didn't really like want to spend my gold because I didn't have enough coal to be able to really support more battleships or enough oil to support many more submarines. So I didn't have much to spend my gold on. So I figured, why not? You know, it's, it's something that makes it a little bit easier and it'll speed up dramatically the amount of time until I'm able to get to Nubia's capital. So at this point, I'm kind of just going to fly through most of the rest of the game because things were, you know, pretty much more of the same for the rest of the game. And one thing is that this game took so much longer than the Nubia game. I, I, I'm pretty sure that I had almost double the amount of footage for this game than I did for the Nubia game just because... Domination games in general just take a lot longer because you have to move a lot more units around. You know, it takes a while to to plan out exactly what you're going to do. So things took quite a long time here. But, you know, continuing with my theme, uh, Australia was my next target. So I was able to go and take their cities pretty easily with the same strategy that I had used for all of my other, you know, uh, attacks with my navy. Um, at this point in the game, it was really nice because I had those battleships and a lot of them were also level 4 as well, which meant they got plus 1 range, so I could just bombard cities from so far away, they could pretty much do nothing in return, and I melted through most of their cities. One other thing to note here is that I believe this happened quite a while ago at this point where, where I'm looking at in the footage, but I did get the final uh, promotion on Moksha that makes it so that you're able to get two promotions because um, whenever I found Yerevan, getting Yerevan plus two promotions means that on every single one of your apostles that you have in the city that uh, Moksha's in, you're able to get both the promotion that makes it so that you eliminate pressure from other religions and the triple spread uh, strength in cities of other or, uh, cities of other civilizations. So with that, you could pretty much instantly, like one turn, convert all cities that are uh, in, in other civilizations. So this is really good for Crusade because you don't have to fool around for, you know, four turns trying to spam out a bunch of spread charges. You just pop one spread charge, city converts to your religion, and then you go ahead and take it. Um, another strength of Crusade plus Religion that a lot of people, I think, sometimes forget about is that you get a ton of arrow score from this, and it, this is honestly something that I had even forgotten about, but in the late game, every time I would convert a city of someone that I was at war with, I, I would normally get, I think it was like anywhere from 3 to 5 arrow score, which is just insane because, you know, doing this 5 times in a row, then all of a sudden you're looking at like 20 arrow score for pretty much nothing, which was really easy and made it super easy to chain together golden ages. And one of the cool things that actually happened later on in this game was that in the information age, I was able to get a golden age and I took the uh, dedication that gives you a free giant death robot which I had totally forgot that this even got added to the game because I so rarely ever see it, but it ended up being just, you know, super cool because I got a giant death robot for free way earlier than I would have otherwise had a giant death robot, and then I was able to use it to go attack people. A few other things that I just want to uh, point out here was that, so whenever I had taken Melbourne, uh, there was a neighborhood that Australia had built in that city, and I, in pretty much every game, I avoid neighborhoods, and people don't know why, but you can see here that upon taking Melbourne, I think enemy spies spawn barbarians in that city at least three or four times within, like, <laughs> within 20 turns, so I pretty much immediately had to put a spy in Melbourne to counter spy there because, god, it is just... So irritating how how incessantly the AI will spam the spawn barbarians things on any neighborhoods you have in your civilization. It's it's just very very irritating. Also, at this point in the game, um, I'm I had snowballed pretty much entirely. I like I, I had just about complete control of the game because I had this you know immense navy of a bunch of missile cruiser armadas, which was insanely strong. They all had a ton of promotions. I had my giant death robot, so. Really, at this point in the game, you're just kind of looking to close out the game. So, what I was doing was I was just going for mainly capitals and cities that were directly around them, just, you know, just to help stabilize loyalty a little bit. So, whenever you're this late into a domination game, you don't have to worry about taking every single city and, you know, taking people out of the game entirely. You can just go for capitals directly and finish things off because it's a lot faster. And either way, everybody in the game probably hates you at this point. So, there's no use in getting rid of those grievances because people are going to hate you no matter what. 
Also something to note about the GDRs is that before you get the siege upgrade on them, they actually don't do that much damage to city walls, but whenever you get the siege upgrade, it gives you a ton, like a ridiculous amount of extra siege strength against hitting city walls so here, so you can see the difference between attacking before I get the siege upgrade and then after I get the siege upgrade, and it's literally like it goes from like a small tap on the city walls to taking out like pretty much half of the city walls health in a single hit. So for the rest of the game here, I had pretty much just gone and I, I used my army to take out most of America and also to take Mongolia's capital and one other of their cities. And then over in Melbourne, I just purchased a few giant death robots because at this point I had so much gold that I didn't, I wasn't using. I really had nothing to do with it. And I bought some more giant death robots to go and finish off Egypt's capital. And just for the memes, I also built a nuke and nuked uh, Egypt at the very end of the game because, I mean, really, what 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 is a domination game without using at least one nuke? So I nuked their capital, finished it off with a giant death robot, and that was the conclusion of the game. So as a whole, this this wasn't the smoothest of the domination games, uh, just because the the start there was a little bit rocky. I was I was unsure if I was really going to be able to start my snowball there whenever I was getting. Whenever I was having a lot of trouble with both Poland and Persia early on, and you know I had I had a failed attack against Persia, I was struggling to defend some of the cities that I had taken from Poland because I was just having so many units thrown at me. But eventually, you know, I was just persistent, spamming out units, making sure I was able to defend myself, and in doing so, I was able to deplete other people's resources and then take over Persia. And at that point, I had pretty much control of. So many resources that there was nothing stopping me from getting that domination win, and from there it was just a pretty, a pretty straightforward stomp of everybody else that was left in the game. So thank you everyone for watching. I have been the Saxy Gamer. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like. If not, feel free to dislike. If you're looking for some more Civilization 6 content, feel free to subscribe. Thank you for watching, and goodbye.